not need potatoes or green beans, but can use pretty much anything else. If you bring items, we are in that sweet spot now where we're not too worried about bugs and we're not too worried about freezing, so there aren't as many rules. We do ask if you're bringing any perishable items, put them on the, the sure. share table. And I would not recommend lettuce. That does not usually survive well on the share table. Um, our paper angel closet, we will be blessing those items next week. Uh, during worship, we invite people to bring items for the blessing box or paper angel closet anytime. But if you bring anything for paper angel closet, please put it in the church office to be inventory first. And we will bring all the things out next Sunday to bless and uh, encourage our paper angel closets ministry. Next Sunday is our Heritage Woods Worship Sunday. So if anybody is interested in being in fellowship with residents of Heritage Woods and uh, being a part of a small worship there, you are welcome to attend. It is at 3 p.m. They have a little community room, and Beth is going to be the preacher next week. Trunk or Treat is October 27th. That's a Sunday at 3 p.m. We still need uh, vehicles, and we still need candy donations. If anybody is interested and willing, we invite everyone to participate one way or another. It is always a fun event. It is uh, something that the community really enjoys, and we see kids from all over coming in and enjoying the time with us. Are there any other special announcements? We continue Christian education at 9 a.m. with our kids and adults. We invite you to come and try it out. It is always good, no matter what group you choose to be in. The kids actually will invite anyone of any age to be a part. We study scripture and we do crafts, and the crafts are more substantial. We're trying to avoid the paper crafts that you get and say, oh, thank you, and hang on your refrigerator and try to decide how long you can have to keep it before you throw it away. Um, we are focused on items that are like doormats and door reeds and hot plates and different things like that that can be used on a regular basis and enjoyed by the whole family, hopefully. So come and be a part of that. We have a few different donation uh, options for St. John's, not only through our tangible items with the blessing box <coughs> and paper angel closet, but we also have what's called Menards Ministry. So if anybody shops at Menards and you get those rebates, if you feel like you're not the kind to turn in a rebate or you just want to give that to the church, we welcome those rebates because we're always having little repairs to do around the church and the rebates help us to pay for light bulbs and different things like that. We also are continuing our open door fundraiser. We are hoping to put in our secondary door and the automation this before the winter hits. Um, that is a goal of ours. So we're looking for uh, donations to reach our goal and um, we still have quite a ways to go. So if you are able and willing, we invite you to give to that special special cause. If there are no other announcements, then let us move into worship together as we join in our choral intro, fresh as the morning. <clears throat>
outwardly and valuing everyone. We live and work amid God's love. In that spirit, we extend love to all who come into our midst, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, race, nationality, skin color, culture, differing abilities, age, or political affiliations, to participate fully in all aspects of our ministry is to bring the good news of Christ's love to all. We work in God's name to tear down walls and build community. To walk with each other through all of life's circumstances. To provide for those in need. To provide comfort to the hurting and the sick. And to uplift the brokenhearted. Where we fail, we ask for God's forgiveness. May the Holy Spirit and our siblings continue to challenge us to do better. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are all in here. Let us call each other to worship. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, O God, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. The Holy One meets us in the stillness of our thoughts, in the joy of our laughter, in the spontaneity of our encounters, in the hope of our presence. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, O God, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. The Creator sustains us with mercy, reassures us with compassion, and he challenges us with grace. <coughs> Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, O oh God, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Let us worship our Maker in spirit and in truth, through pain and despair, with the wholeness of our being. Everlasting God, we come before you with questions, and you question us in return. We declare that you are good, and you have declared us good. May we acknowledge that you make all things new. You redeem our days, and you empower us to be your people. In your presence there is joy, and there is struggle. Peace surpasses understanding, and on our hearts break. This defines the fullness of human community and experience of the companionship with you. We give thanks for your presence and trust that you reign to transform the impossible into the possible. May it so in us and through us in your precious name. Please join me in hymn number one, Immortal, Invisible, God Only.
by Steve Garnett's poems as an affirmation of faith. We give our hearts to you, God, creator of all, giver of life, source of all that is, whose love is faithful, whose grace is abundant, whose heart is generous with mercy. We follow Jesus the Christ, the embodiment of God's love, who taught and healed, who fed the hungry, who set us free from our fears and wants. He was crucified and died, but in the infinite generosity of your grace, you raised him to life. He reigns among us, living proof of your steadfast love, calling us to faithful trust in you. We live by the Holy Spirit, your word unfolding in us, that leads us to live lives of gratitude and trust, compassion, courage, and generosity. We believe in the power of forgiveness, the reality of resurrection, the gift of the community of the body of Christ, and the mystery of eternal life. In gratitude to God, we commit ourselves to lives of abundant love. For the sake of the world, in the name of Christ, who lives and reigns with the Creator and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Thank you. 
confess our attachment to things of this world, to our possessions, and to objects of status. We acknowledge the pride we take in doing good things that require little of us, while turning away from the needed things that challenge our wants and desires. Make us repairers of brokenness and restorers of loss. Help us to discern that life in full pursuit of your kingdom is rich, full, and free. Even as you test us, help us meet the moment with abiding love and abiding faith. Amen. Dear one, God is with you. Hear these words of assurance from 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful and will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, God will also provide the way out, so that you may be able to endure it. Make us glad. 
glad for so many days that you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your word be manifest to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and prosper for us the work of our hands. O oh, prosper the work of our hands. May the Lord add his blessing to our hearing and our understanding of his word. Amen. We don't usually spend a lot of time preaching on Job. Job's a hard one to just get snippets of from the Bible because it is, well, the story of Job is just a bummer. And there's just a little, little kind of glimmer of hope that comes at the end. And it's supposed to make you feel better because, oh, Job has got family and prosperity again. But I can't help but read the book of Job and see that ending and also think you wiped out his, all of his children and think that a new batch is going to make up for that part of it. But this, in the midst of all of Job's suffering, this speech that Job gives is actually rather powerful and honestly relatable to, I think, most humans. Because the book of Job is a book that is written by people who follow God and who ask the question, why do bad things happen? And what? Do we do? How do we face it? When the world starts to make no sense, when things start to overshadow what, what was bringing light and joy into <coughs> our life, how do we face that darkness? And Job is kind of this stereotype of grief in that he's he starts this speech with kind of a, oh, if God and I had to sit down, I'd tell God what's what. He starts talking about how if they just could sit down, he could, he could put his case before God, and then God would answer, and Job would understand. And that's Job's wish. But then we see Job start to shift. And he reminds himself not only of his past steadfast faithfulness to God, but also his wish to continue. And as he does that, you can see that he starts to realize the power and wonder of God, that God is so mysterious, but also all-powerful. And then suddenly, Job kind of seems to back away from that, I'll tell God what's what. And ends with wanting to hide in a dark and hidden place. But through all of the suffering and all that Job faces, the one thing that he sticks to is his desire to maintain his faithfulness. Because truthfully, that's all he can control. He can't control anything outside of himself. And all of the trials that he's been through prove that immensely. He has had one misfortune after another, and the only thing not taken from him is his wife and a few friends, who, by the way, are completely unhelpful and unsupportive. His wife has this great idea of just curse God and die. And his friends come along and continually try to convince him that all of these bad things have happened because you, Job, have messed up and have been unfaithful. But through all of this, Job knows who he is and who he wants to be and realizes that this is the one thing that cannot be taken from him. Even in this moment when I feel that God has been taken from me, that God is beyond my sight, 
and beyond my experience. When Job feels abandoned by God, Job refuses to abandon that. Now, as the book of Job starts to conclude, Job does get to have a one-on-one -on -one with God. And God comes down in a whirlwind that is impossible to hide from and gives an answer that I am not sure Job truly understands. Because it's hard for any of us in the midst of grief to understand and yet, being the man who is faithful and has chosen faith through all, maybe he understands better than any of us. Because God's answer is, I am God, and who are you to argue? That being said, at no point does God say all of this happens because you argue. In fact, God shows up for the conversation. There are times in grief and suffering that I've heard people try to stamp down and quiet any kind of arguments or frustrations with God, but sometimes that is the best way to express faith. Because we don't argue with things that aren't there. Hopefully. We don't mourn something that never existed, usually. We understand that God is not only all-powerful, but also relatable and calls us into relationship. And a part of relationship is being able to be honest about who we are and making that general that genuine connection that includes the good and the bad and the ugly. Job doesn't deny the suffering he's experienced. He lives in it fully and acknowledges it fully. He also doesn't accept the kind of cultural idioms that people put upon his suffering. He doesn't sit around and believe what society tells him that only bad things happen to bad people and good things happen to good people. Job knows better and he knows his heart and his relationship with God, even when God seems to not be around. When it comes to suffering and sorrow and hurt, we all struggle with the way that we mourn and the way we express sadness and anger. And what I try to remind myself and others is those are not bad feelings. To have anger and frustration and sadness, that's not where we go wrong. Where we go wrong is how we deal with it. How do we face the dark? Do we use the dark to hide from who we are and who we want to be? Do we use the dark from shame or a way to avoid what we need to do? Do we use the dark as a way to throw shadows on others when their joy is starting to seep into our space? Job sits in his sorrow, in a full honesty, and knows what it is. But when there is an opportunity to step out of it, he does. Now when we talk about the imagery of light and dark, we always think that the darkness is something terrible and bad. This is a cultural thing that's put into us, and it's something that perhaps we developed because of other elements of life as well, because we know that we get energy from the sun and plants grow from the sun, but we also know 
that we need night time. We need night time because if we don't have night, our bodies never fully shut down and get good sleep, and then we stop growing. We need night time so that the earth cools down a little bit and the plants get time to rest and restart. We need the dark and that cycle of light and darkness to balance. Sometimes when it comes to grief, taking time to sit and acknowledge the grief might seem to some like that negative darkness, but the truth is, is that it is that cooling and comforting shade that allows you to rest so you can move forward. Now we don't usually go seeking grief and heartache and anger, but it comes to us because that's what comes with love and joy is to fully know those, you have to know the other. So how do we use our shady spaces, our dark corners, and our hidden secrets? How do we use these moments when the light seems far away? Do we use them to rest and reflect and grow? Or do we use them as an excuse to shrivel up and hide and hold on to it so that we can find ways to keep out the growing light that comes the next cycle? Job lives through two distinct cycles in his life and both are beautiful and wondrous and blessed. And we read a section of his life in his darkest, saddest hour. But he takes this darkest, saddest hour and turns it into a time where he finds a way to use it to grow. May we all find a way to face our dark moments that can be healing and comforting, that can be a way to grow even when it hurts, and that it can be a way to help us to appreciate and embrace the light when it comes the next day. The Lord be with you. Generosity is a spiritual gift that may be cultivated, grown, and nurtured. Let us plant seeds today with our gifts that will bloom and provide a harvest beyond our expectations or imaginations. As we come into a time of generosity during our worship, we remember that there are many ways to give, not only through treasures and funds, but through our time and talent as well. We give thanks at this time for all of our gifts that we are able to give and that we have also received. As we send the plates around, we recognize that not everyone has something to put in the plate. So we invite you to hold the plate and offer prayer. When we pass around the wood plate, we invite you to put in our special offering, which for this month, October, goes to Neighbors in Need, which is a special offering that is used in many different ways throughout the country by different UCC churches and communities to help fill gaps and encourage community that is much needed in their spaces. The wooden plates are for the neighbor in need offering. The bronze plates are for the general fund of St. John's Church that helped to take care of the building and the staff and encourage ministries beyond these walls. 
If you're giving online, we invite you to go to our website, stjohns401.org, and click the donation button or scan the QR code on the back of the bulletin. Come for all things are ready.